to Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. From relationship problems to family feuds, he's got all the advice and expert help you'll need. Dr. Stan Trigger. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, if you're just joining us, you missed a very interesting first hour. It was all about being single and how to find that perfect mate in 90 days. Whoa. And we were going to talk some more about relationships this hour as well. And we have some wonderful guests with us. Jerry, is it pronounced Gertson? Gertson. Jerry Gertson. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, Jerry is with, uh, he's the director of Riverbend Counseling Group, and they offer uh, therapy for individuals, couples, and families. They also do a lot of group therapy and workshops, and they have a life coach. And uh, Jerry's been counseling for over 20 years. He's written a book called Relational Triumph, a guide on how to resolve stress that comes from relationships. If you're in a relationship, there's going to be stress. Also in the studio with us, a regular member of our Sunday night family. Great to have him back, Dr. Eli Karam. And Dr. Karam is president of our Kentucky Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. He's an assistant professor at the Kent School of Social Work at the University of Louisville. And how to reach Dr. Karam is uh, his website's elikaram.com and Twitter, Dr. Dr. Eli Live, spell Dr. it out. Dr. Eli Live, That's E-L-I, Dr. Eli Live. That's right. All of that will be up at uh, Frager.com, tips from Tony and Dr. Stan, so be sure and check it out. All right, so we'll get we'll get going here, and uh, and why don't you start us off, Mr. Gertzen, with um, uh, what your, your take on mental health today and... Uh, there, there, mental health seems to have such a wide breadth of disorders. We're about to come out with the DSM-5, which will redefine it a little bit. But um, we have personality disorders. They wanted to claim that uh, uh, Sandusky had an access to personality disorder. That was his defense. It obviously didn't work. He got convicted on All right. 45 of 48. So I think what you're saying, Dr. Stan, <clears throat> is, is Gary responds is this kind of stigma that still, and we, I don't know about Canada where you're from, sir, but certainly here in, in Kentucky and Louisville area, there's still uh, counseling or therapy, which is not a bad thing and can be health and strengths oriented. Still people see it with a negative uh, kind of pathology-based uh, emphasis. So what is your take today on that? Yeah, I definitely believe that there are people who face that too, the the stigma, the shame, or the the sense of dread of coming into a counselor's office and wondering what people might think if they're spotted on the sidewalk <laughs> just outside the door. I have people who park in the parking lot uh, half a block down the street just so that they don't have to be seen in the front of my parking lot. It's an old joke. You don't see motorcycles parked in front of a psychiatrist's <laughs> office. <laughs> Except my own. <laughs> uh, there yeah, you go. That's true. Well... You know, humans have a fundamental need for that social inclusion, and there's a sense in which having a mental need, mental health need, is going to exclude them from that, and people are going to shame them or something like that. And um, and yet, you know, without going for a checkup, without going for a, an oil change on our vehicle, or going to see the dentist about our teeth, um, things are going to happen, right, over the long haul. Um, we become more susceptible to the dangers and the pressures and the stress that we put on our body, and it's the same with our mind. Our mind is an organ, and uh, we do need to pay attention to it. So I'm a strong believer that, um, well, just like William Sweetser said uh, when he coined the term mental hygiene in the mid-19th century, that, uh, that we need to put some effort into to the inside of our body just like we do to the outside. It, it is funny, as you mentioned, that these other things that just come as standard operating procedure, go in and see your family doc for this, go in and get your eyes checked, your 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 dental exam twice yearly, things that we would take for granted that a mental health or, or relational checkups could be the exact same way if, if you viewed them that way, but somehow people have a hard but time wrapping a, their head around yeah, that. Super problem. I've worked the last six, seven years with the United States Army, 
in reducing suicide and domestic violence, which has just been a huge problem. Is, and suicide now is back. We had, we had gotten it down a little bit, and now it's climbing again mm-hmm. with the return of so many soldiers. And uh, the, one of the biggest hurdles we have to overcome is the stigma associated with getting behavioral health help if you're in the military because this is seen as weakness. And uh, soldiers pride themselves in being strong. And there are a certain amount of just uh, occupational stressors or what we'd call developmentally normal stressors, whether you're in the military or just starting a relationship, like we talked about in the first hour, or you're just having children. There are some, again, predictable stressors that if you have uh, an experienced person uh, to take you along on your journey, a therapist, a counselor, they can help normalize some of that for you. And I guess some of the things, I don't know what you think, uh, Jerry, but some of the things that uh, mimic uh, mental health or disorders really just come when people are really stressed out from predictable, uh, developmentally normal relationships and individual uh, milestones that they're going through. It's so true what you're talking about. In fact, I just read a study not long ago um, where apparently 1,500 employees were um, interviewed about the stress that they were facing in the workplace with coworkers or supervisors. So this study was looking specifically at relational stress. And um, over the last five, over those five years that they were being queried about, um, the particular people who said to the to the researchers that they were experiencing um, considerable stress, not just average, but considerable stress. Um, were more likely to be diagnosed with mental health issues. They had more suicidal thoughts and behaviors, hospitalizations, addictions, clinical depression, and so on. So relational stress is a huge factor, and people are looking for answers to resolve that problem because we all have it. What are some, that, Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I think that the human nature... Um, basically has a sweeping need for a sense of significance and security and so when when our significance uh, you know having a sense to do with our identity uh, being respected and valued and so on when that's undermined or when our security is taken away from us when we feel like uh, things are unstable then uh, the stress inside is going to go up and and then i think we become co-contributors to the to the stressful cycle in relationships where where we begin to add to the stress that's already present because of reactionary problems. You're exactly right. And if people don't have a way, if they are inside the bubble of their own head and they feel for whatever reason that they're not close enough to their spouse or people will judge them and they can't vent these momentary stressors and if you let something build and build, when it finally does blow, it comes out in sometimes really uh, damaging ways for the relationship, for the individual. So being able to turn to your partner or your network of people in time is very important. But some people don't learn that growing up or they don't know that. They think they have to solve it all themselves, uh, which really uh, is not the way to go. It's so true. I, I love the what you guys were talking about in the first hour I thought was so dynamic. Uh, some, of what, some of the comments reminded me of, of John Bradshaw and some of the work he did, especially in the 80s and the 90s. Mm-hmm. He, he talked a lot about source relationships, you know, and in the early years when we are, are children and, are, and so dependent, ultimately reliant on the, uh, the family environment. And if our, our social needs, our, our needs for self-esteem aren't being built up intentionally during those years, we're likely to go into our adult years with some deficits, and the foundation is going to be a little shaky. So, so then when stress does come up, with, when a conflict occurs or, or some kind of issue that, that uh, becomes chronic, we won't necessarily have the skills to, to tackle those things with uh, with a smoothness that can resolve rather than um, adding and contributing to the problem. And that's part of the problem. I don't know if you followed uh, the trial of Sandusky, the assistant coach at Penn. A little bit from here. But, uh, they, they wanted to claim he had an access to histrionic personality disorder. And I've never understood, I didn't understand how a pedophile has histrionic personality disorder. 
I, I failed to see the connection. And I taught psychopathology for about 20 years. But that one just went right on past me. Dr. Karam, what do you think? <clears throat> well, I think we, we could probably spend a whole hour talking about Jerry Sandusky. But there are, I think your point is that some people will use a mental health diagnosis, a DSM uh, Axis One, which is you know your major uh, disorders like anxiety or yeah, depression. Yeah, but they were pushing the, for this Axis Two personality Axis, Axis Two, which is a more stable, lifelong characteristics. And I guess some people will use personality disorders uh, as a crutch of why they can't. In some ways, uh, and we can talk about this in the next segment, why disorders sometimes are normalizing but can also cause other troubles once you have that label. All right, with Jerry Gerton and Dr. Eli Karam, I'm Dr. Stan Frager, and we're here for you. We'll be right back. Let's talk with Dr. Stan Frager. Dr. Stan Frager is standing by to give you insight on issues that matter most to you. Call now, 571-0970. All right, and welcome. Talking with Jerry Gerton, and he's author of a very interesting book called Relational Triumph. We'll hear more about that in a little bit. And also, Dr. Eli Kieran, my colleague from the University of Louisville, president of our Kentucky Association of Marriage and Family Therapists and a professor there. And I'm a psychologist. We got all the bases touched tonight. Right. We're, we're talking about this idea. If somebody has a diagnosable condition, depression, anxiety, what have you, in some ways that can be a good thing in that it gives you finally a label to put together these cl clusters of symptoms or this way you've been experiencing the world. And in some ways it's a bad thing, other people will tell you, because depending on what the diagnosis is, it stigmatizes them, or yet other people, loved ones, family members, or someone will say, well, you hide behind your diagnosis of this or that, or you blame everything on your depression or your anxiety. And so uh, what is your take, uh, Jerry, on this idea of uh, diagnoses, are they good or are they bad as far as uh, helping people move on in their lives and with their relationships? Well, Dr. Kiram, you've, you've really summarized it very well. I think there are good and bad to it. Sometimes I lean over to the drawer of my desk and I simply say to people that the diagnosis uh, or the label, as you put it, simply gives us a handle on the drawer to which we can we can manage it. It doesn't necessarily tell us all about the stuff that's in the drawer. And so we look inside and we realize most often that we are just a product of a bunch of things, not just um, a mental condition. We're a product of our genetic constitution. We're a product of our environment. We're a product of our choices. And so I think all, all factors have to be taken into consideration. I think some of the biggest uh, breakthroughs I've had working with clients is especially if they have a biological component to one of the disorders, i.e. depression. And we know some depression is, is situationally based, but many is, is beyond the person's control. They have a, yeah. you know, a hormonal imbalance, a, 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 a gap there that, that no talk therapy the, could the address serotonin without. serotonin yes. isn't being reuptake. Right. So this idea that people can, or yes, too much, realize too that I serotonin. have a condition, just like if I was a diabetic and I needed insulin. You know, I am depression, and I need uh, serotonin. Uh, I need um, an antidepressant medication. And when people can really get on board with that, it is a freeing thing, and it really lets them embrace help. I, I'm curious. Well, my students yeah. hear me a, a thousand times, Dr. Karam. I would tell them, this diagnosis drives treatment. How in the world do you treat somebody if you don't know what was wrong? And the example I use, how would you like to walk into a physician's office and the physician, he or she, says to you, I, uh, I'm going to put a cast on your leg. And you said, but I'm here for my finger. <laughs> I heard my finger. No, we're doing casts on legs today. <laughs> and so diagnosis drives treatment. How in the world do you treat if you don't know what's wrong? And, and sometimes, as, as you know, Mr. Gertzen, uh, people will come to you and people like Dr. Stan and myself because they have seen a doctor first. And the doctor has ruled out, uh, this and that, and says you need you need to go and talk to somebody about therapy. How do you deal with those type of potential clients or patients that uh, may not be on board with the talk therapy aspect of of what's going on with them? They came to a doctor, a medical doctor, and the doctor said, "Go and see a therapist." Yeah, interestingly, that doesn't happen as often as it, it occurs the opposite way. 
uh, most often people are reluctant that I find reluctant to go see a doctor because I suggest that talk therapy isn't the whole ball of wax that they need. Um, however, on occasion, some people do come, as you suggested. And uh, But most people who come into my office are highly motivated because, in general, they have to pay or they're paying through their employee assistance program, and so they view it as a benefit. And so I don't get a lot of reluctant people. Um, I, I deal with, with more um, trying to help people understand that their body and their mind are connected. The anatomy of the soul is not static. It's moving. It's constantly evolving. And, um, and so the, the idea of bridging medical profession and psychology, I think, is a worthy cause. And I'm so pleased to be a part of the profession that can help people understand the connection. Yeah, so if, you, if you had a skeptic, uh, Jerry, that would say, okay, well, uh, explain to me, how are mental health and physical health connected? Because, you know, you're preaching to the choir here. We, we agree right, with you. It's this biopsychosocial model. We're all interconnected. But if you had a skeptical person out, out there listening to us in Radio Land or coming into your office, how would you tell them mental health and physical health are related? Mm -hmm. Well, I would suggest to them, I, I might tell them stories. For example, I have a friend who... who um, her husband was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and in the mild stages of it, it was fine and all that, but over time, he became more and more uh, violent, and um, there was a need to, to increase and improve on the medication side of it, and um, also to, to realize that she needed to take care of herself in order for him to be well, in order for her to help him be well as possible. She needed time away. She needed to get to the gym. She needed to go for a walk. She needed time to meditate. And um, she needed to take her own medicine and her own vitamins and eat well. And as she found that, she could concentrate better on him as she concentrated on herself. Story, stories are great, uh, very mm -hmm. powerful testimonials to other clients, as you're saying. Metaphors right. are also good. I like the metaphor of, you know, you're on the plane, and uh, the plane is going down. What do they tell you? The oxygen mass drops, and the first thing they tell you to do before you can put it on your loved one or your spouse is to put it on yourself. And mm -hmm. without taking care of yourself, as you said, how can we be there for people that, that need us the most unless we are... Uh, you know, emotionally regulated. Unless we've practiced this self-care, how are we going to be there? Or for sometimes they, they, they say two masks will drop down, <laughs> and so if you're there with your child and you're flying with your child, put one on yourself first, like you said, Dr. Karen, mm -hmm. and then place the other one on your child. Now, of course, if you're traveling with two children, put it on your favorite child. Decide. Dr. That's it. <laughs> My mother would have probably put it on my twin brother. Quickly but, uh, decide which one do you like the most. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. But uh, well, it, it is it is a good point that the people need to know that part of any type of good uh, talk therapy or, or plan, behavioral plan that you put together for your mental health is going to involve some type of physical health component. And I think that's so important, too, that people practice what they preach. And, uh, yeah. and I, I don't know about you, uh, Jerry, but I know that's important to Dr. Stan and myself, that if yeah. you don't take care of yourself, how are you going to be there for other people? Well, how are you what is the that? first thing we do with our okay. patients when they come to our office? When did you last have a physical checkup? I want you to go see your physician and get a thorough checkup. I mean, if that thyroid is deficient, you could be Freud in bathing his water. That well, person's exactly. going to be depressed. Look out. We got to go. Be right back. Okay. 970 WGTK. Helping you make sense of life's daily challenges and much more on 970 WGTK. Doctor, my eyes have seen the years and the slow parade of fears without pride. Now I want to understand. Doctor, my eyes. Hello and welcome. I'm psychologist Stan Frager, and every Sunday night, 8 to 10 is our time together. It's been very interesting. Talk about relationships and mental health tonight with Dr. Eli Karam from the University of Louisville and the Kentucky Association of Marriage Family Therapists, and Jerry Gortzen, author of a book called Relational Triumph and uh, a very interesting counselor by way of Canada. 
great to have you with us. And uh, uh, when it comes to relationships, uh, you know, sometimes they get pretty violent. Do you think there's a threshold that a spouse or loved one gets to at which time they need to just leave or protect themselves? You know, at what point, typically it's the woman, without being sexist about this, but typically it's the woman and it's the husband who's the batter. By the way, I've seen that reverse, but it's very rare. And uh, at what point do you tell your clients, you know what, you've taken enough beating, you need to move on? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Because and that's the a, bit, the most dangerous moment of all is when they move out of the house. Well, it is. It, it's uh, and it's such a sad, desperate situation in that moment because most most of the people who are the battered have been around for so long with that individual, and they've become climatized to the hurtfulness of the relationship. To, they're, they're fatigued as well as climatized to it. And so they're, they're in a horrible mental state most often in order to make that decision, weakened beyond belief, and they don't trust themselves, and it's hard to trust another voice as well. So, yeah. I, I mean, I try my very best to help people realize that as soon as a spouse or a, or a partner starts with violence that is, you know, slamming their fist on the table, punching a window, kicking the wall, throwing the dog. Uh, those kinds of anger outbursts are only half a step away from the spouse being the next target. And so they need to have a plan, a plan of escape, a plan to, to remove themselves. Right. I'd like to distinguish, too, kind of what we know, what is, um, you know, most people think when they see the you know, media or TV that every there's these male batters out there. And we know there are a certain degree of what we call these intimate terrorism that the research and the literature has, has documented, these intimate terrorists. And these are the people that are pathological, antisocial types of personalities that uh, seek to control and empower in the relationship. Then there's others, situational violence, where people that really care about each other but do not have the skills to fight fairly, to communicate well, and right. things erupt. Uh, and, and those are the ones we'd like to work with in couples therapy. And then there's also, to get back to our theme tonight, there are people on the precipice of mental illness, uh, and, you know, they, and that can start depending on the illness at a different age for anybody, but maybe they are uh, bipolar or there's some type of diagnosed mental illness, and they are not they have not come to terms with that. They have not got help from that yet, and it's very hard for the spouse to stay in that relationship. So, or as uh, Jerry was using the example earlier, uh, could be schizophrenic. And if there's high expressed emotion in the house with family members or significant other, you know that is could sometimes be a recipe for disaster, especially if that schizophrenic is getting more paranoid and disorganized in their thinking. So a lot of violence in relationships comes. Uh, when there is a uh, uh, misdiagnosed or undiagnosed mental illness between partners. Mm -hmm. So true. Yep. And, you know, the, the, the reality, too, is that the partners who, who need to, re with regards to any of those situations, and they may need to get out, uh, even temporarily, just for a, a time of healing separation. Uh, I like that concept, by the way, instead of saying, okay, you're done, you'll never see each other again. Um, but trying the pathway of giving time apart so that they can begin to reorganize their own thoughts, begin to find a little stability underneath their feet, uh, begin to refresh their mind and their body. Sometimes they're so weary and tired they just haven't even been sleeping and they've been paying the bills and trying to stay on top of it and even having more expenses than they normally would because of the violence and so on. Jerry, how do you handle it, uh, relationship-based therapist? If someone comes into your office, uh, or maybe a couple, and says, you know, I, I love you, but I cannot be here with you anymore until you address your problem. Your anger, your depression, your anxiety, what have you, is out of control, and I love you, but I cannot stay here with you anymore until you address it. Uh, it, it. It ups the ante. It puts that person in a, a, a bind. How, how do you handle that? Uh, what would you tell that spouse to do? Which spouse now are you talking about? Uh, this is a spouse that gets the ultimatum. The other spouse or family mm -hmm. member loves them, but they can no longer support okay. them without getting help. you got one minute. Correct. Well, that person who's being booted needs the support also. They need to be believed in because they feel like their lifeline is being taken away from them, 
and they need to understand that they also need a lifeline and it's legitimate for them to reach out. And so they're going to have to come up with a plan that uh, includes other people in their life that will take a substitute role for a period of time by giving them support along the way. There you go. Talking with Jerry Gertzen, 571-0970, 571-0970. What are the challenges, issues you're faced with right now? And with Dr. Eli Karam, I'm Dr. Stan Frager. We're all here for you at 970 WGTK. Goodbye, Dr. You found Let's Talk with Dr. Stan Frager. Dr. Stan Frager is standing by to give you insight on issues that matter most to you. Call now, 571-0970. All right, always nice to have you with us. And we're talking with um, Dr. Eli Karam and with Dr. Jerry Gertzen. And uh, again, the information about Dr. Gertzen's book, Relational Triumph, can be found at Frager.com. Check out tips from Tony and Dr. Stan. We thank him. Um, I was going to talk about Sandusky a little bit. My friend Alan Pazeitzer says, well, he's going from Penn State to the state pen. Yeah. I thought that was pretty good. I thought that was, you know, Dr. Karam isn't even laughing. I thought that was pretty good. Oh, I, I, I thought so. Oh, Jerry Sandusky. I hadn't mean, heard that before. Because, Penn State to the state pen. Yeah. I wouldn't want to live in Sandusky, Ohio. I'll tell you that much. What can I say? Kaboom. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I'm what, what, yeah. Let me Let yeah. me ask you this. Um, Jerry, what, what advice do you give some of your seniors who are fighting dementia or Alzheimer's? They're, they're showing some memory loss. Uh, ways they can preserve their mental health and physical well-being. Mm, that's a really good question. Uh, interestingly, I, for myself, I mean, I'm not quite a senior yet. I'm in my early 50s, but what I've experimented with... I have with, socks older than you, Jerry. <laughs> I'm wearing a pair right now. Uh, I, I find um, some types of mental games to be very helpful. For example, Sudoku um, is such a linear graph uh, game that uh, it makes my mind function more sharply when I have to deal with a lot of emotions. And, of course, all of us deal with that, right, with the clients in our offices. And so um, sort of a linear-based game that helps think clearly, strategically, uh, seems to be of help. And I, I'd like to know if there's been any studies on that type of thing. Because well, I, I don't know exact studies, but I do know that there's a huge component when, uh, in this example, tying to our theme tonight, if, if you're working with someone uh, aging or with early onset dementia, uh, there are going to be obviously physical declines, but certainly uh, pathology associated with that, uh, depression, anxiety, and it affects not just the individual, the whole family system. So any type of uh, good treatment is going to have a family component that is stressed on, heavy on psychoeducation, what to expect as your significant other or aging loved one is going through this. And I guess that's uh, another question we had for you, Jerry, is, you know, mental health issues definitely impact the whole family system. And how do you work with significant others or family members when you have a, a significant mental health issue? They have to be included, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, a systems approach is vital to dealing with people like that. Um, we, we talked briefly earlier about self-care, placing boundaries um, that are helpful to retain one's strength and so on, coordinating efforts, sometimes the simplest things, like being able to have telephone, texting kind of communication and access to one another, uh, the practical elements of, of uh, shopping for groceries and determining what's a good healthy diet, seeing a dietary expert if that's ne necessary yep. and helpful. Uh, some of it comes down to a lot of simple logistics. And it does bring up a lot, too, for, for the, the spouse or significant other. They need a plan, too. It's not only a plan for the person with the mental health issue. It's the plan for the rest of the family. And, and, and acknowledging that, giving them a psychoeducation or acknowledging that is so, uh, so key. And a lot of what we know about family therapy is based on, you know, early research around schizophrenia and around other disorders that said the structure of the family is so important to 
either uh, the etiology of the disorder, or maintaining disorder, uh, and certainly making it better, i.e. with schizophrenia, bringing the level of expressed emotion down in the family, we found that that's huge. And all the current research says, yeah, you do not want to match uh, somebody's crazy with a brand of your own, so to speak. You want to remain calm. Uh, bring expressed emotion down, and very, very important to understand how the family system uh, uh, comp uh, uh, figures in uh, I I illness of an individual. So that's why I think when we have these individual disorders, lots of people in, in my end of the field, marriage and family therapy, are advocating for these more relational diagnoses, these relational components that help explain uh, the individual disorder. How much work do you get to well, do? Well, again, with sometimes yeah. they're enablers. Yeah, sure, and they have to know, and they're doing it because they love it, and that's uh, because they love that they person. They love the person. Exactly, and, and, and if they don't have the correct psychoeducation, if they don't have the therapeutic support, it's going to be hard right. for them to help that individual, truly. How many uh, couples and families do you work with, uh, Jerry, in, in your practice? We've Well, last year we've done, we worked with probably roughly 2,000 in that neighborhood. Wow. We have, yeah, well, we have six practitioners here, so we're hopping busy and, uh, um, you know, grateful for the opportunity, at the same time sad when there's so much need. And, uh, you know, I'm at the cusp of trying to figure out whether I should grow even more with enlarging the staff because of that need. But, I, you know, the, which brings me to another point in, in your earlier question about how to work with the family system. I find that families who actually take the risk, which seems to be an, a risk for many of them, to go outside and um, find a support group, take, take, take their family issue away from the cover-up and disclose themselves to, to others who are also struggling, just having that, that sense of community and togetherness, listening to other people's stories, finding out how they manage similar issues, um, support groups can be a huge benefit. You're right. We talked to earlier about the shame of the in, to the individual of the disorder. It, it has a whole uh, systemic uh, ripple effect to the family, and sometimes just being transparent about what you're facing and getting support through other people that have gone through it as well is, is it can be so very uh, therapeutic. If we if if a, if a listener out there uh, reads a relational triumph, willing to uh, uh, if they read your book. What will they get, uh, Jerry, based on uh, what we've already said tonight and maybe what we haven't said? Well, they'll get the idea that they play a cru crucial part in the dynamics of any relationship, regardless of what the stressors might be. Um, and this, one of the first steps of cure, I, I would suggest, is to become a student of oneself, needing to observe what is my relational style when under stress, whether it's with a colleague at work or a spouse or a, an extended family member, and um, to be able to look at, am I, do I tend to be a rescuer? Do I tend to try to help and fix it right away? Or do I tend to, to rush over to the, uh, the judgment side and look for what's fair? And, and of course, uh, that's the quick and easy way that so many of us do, mm -hmm. is you take that quick and easy, fast look. Right. All right, we'll take one more little break and then be right back. I'm Dr. Stan Frager with Dr. Eli Karam, Dr. Jerry Gibson. We're here for you. Doctor, my eyes have seen the years and the slow parade of fears without pride. Now I want to understand. Doctor, my eyes. Been really nice having you with us. We have just a few minutes left, Jerry. Um, what about some practical things a person can do to maintain or enhance their mental health? Well, as I was saying about my book, I think uh, becoming a, an observer of oneself is to find out what my needs are. And so if I need to go for a walk, if I need to do some meditation, if I need to uh, spend time with a friend, some people are more sociotropic in nature and they fuel up by being with people. And um, well, while others are more introvert and they fuel up by being alone. So I think a person really needs to study themselves. And some people aren't aware well enough to know what they're, uh, they're, how to meet those needs. And so talking with a life coach or talking with a therapist can be really helpful to discover what really are my needs and how can I put a plan in place 
to facilitate that in order to enjoy a long, fulfilling life. I mean, we all want to be happy, right? There you go. We all want to be happy. That's the goal. That's the finish. How would you say in 10 seconds, if, if there's something that's too heavy that you feel for some reason you have to deal with it on your own, there, there's never something that is, is, is that you can't voice to somebody else, whether it be someone in your support network, a spouse, a significant other, a family member, or uh, you know, a mental health professional. It, it's not a bad thing. There should not be a stigma against talking to somebody. So, uh, I, right. I want to thank you so much. And again, information about uh, Jerry's book will be found at Frager.com. Click on Tips from Tony and Dr. Stan. We thank Tony Safina for all the good research he always puts up there. And then how to contact you and so forth is all there. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Appreciate it a lot. Take care, Take Jerry. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night for now. Dr. Karam, always good to see you. Always love being here, Dr. Stan. Appreciate that, Dr. Eli Karam. And again, you can uh, reach Dr. Karam. We've got all his information on our website as well. And Karam is K-A-R-A-M. Like AM radio. And Eli is E-L-I. www.elikaram.com. There you go. And so you can find them there. And... Uh, Tom Mitchell, thank you, buddy, for running the board. We always have lots of folks helping us. Chloe Caroga is our producer, and uh, it's great having her help as well. And so it's been a good week. What's on your agenda real quick? What you got coming up, Dr. Karen? I am going to enjoy the uh, next couple of weeks. i got some writing deadlines for the Kent School. I'm taking uh, my wife and children to Disney World in uh, July, and I will probably see you and your listeners back here in August. There you go. Where that you know where Disney World is, they have the new Carland or something. They got they got everything, my friend. And trust me, it's, it's the most expensive place on earth, as well as the happiest place. On <laughs> Not earth. only happy, but expensive. Yeah, we love you. Thank you so much, Doctor Karen. Great to have you with us. I'm Doctor Stan Frager. I hope it's been a good week for you, and that the coming week is even better. So until next Sunday night, take care.